Today we're taking a look at some comic book history and diving into the different age of comic books. Plus, I'm wearing a vest again, so you're gonna want to stick around for that. Welcome to Comic Misconceptions. Yes, Comic Misconceptions. After last week's one-shot video, you guys said that the name should stay even though we don't technically talk about misconceptions. So, plenty of love from you guys in the comments as well, and I can't say thank you enough. Anyway guys, I'm Scott Nicewander, and this is the show that takes you into detail about the things you think you know about comics, and we're talking about the different ages of comic books today. Right out of the gate, guys, I want to let you know that I am in no way a comic book historian. I've just done a ton of research over the last week and found that most of this stuff is based off of opinions. It's not even just when the certain ages start and end, but also how many there are. So I'm going to tell you everything I've learned and allow you to make your own opinions in the end. And I had to cut a lot of stuff out of this episode because of time constraints. It's already going to be really long. And also, both Marvel and DC have done name changes over the years, but just for the sake of simplicity, I will just simply be referring to them as Marvel and DC. So let's start off in a time before comic books even existed. In the early 20th century, comics themselves were a staple in most newspapers, but they were just little one or two panel short jokes. It wasn't until a couple decades later that comics themselves would be put into a book format. While there were other attempts at creating comic books, it's agreed that the first successful one was Funnies on Parade in 1933. Now comic books like these were just reprints of newspaper comic strips and sold for 10 cents each. Now that's important for later. So remember that. It wasn't long until comic book publishers ran out of material to reprint, so they had to come up with their own original content. One publisher, DC Comics, took a chance on a frequently rejected idea from the minds of Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, Superman. And it was with this, ladies and gentlemen, Action Comics number one in 1938 that the golden age of comic books took off. You can also watch my video about the real origin of Superman before his action comic days right here where he was a villainous psychopath bent on world domination. It's fascinating. The golden age of comic books can be summed up as simple, straightforward, and often patriotic. Superheroes like Batman and Superman saved the day, no questions asked. The art was simple and cartoony. People believed that children were the only ones reading these things, so superheroes often got kid sidekicks to give the reader someone to relate to and also the hero someone to talk to. Now simple these stories may be, but don't confuse simple with childish. Superheroes weren't exactly moral people. Right? Superman was crazy and tough. A guy would shoot him and instead of just letting the bullet bounce off, he took the guy's gun, shot him back, only to catch the bullet at the last second just to give the guy a good scare. And you know Batman's vow to not use guns or kill people? Well, he didn't have that in the Golden Age. He used guns quite frequently and had a thing for snapping people's necks. World War II came around and Marvel Comics put out a patriotic superhero that grabbed people's attention from the first cover. Captain America and many other superheroes went off to fight the Nazis and Japanese soldiers who were often portrayed as disfigured abominations instead of, you know, People. Unfortunately, after the war ended, nobody really wanted superheroes anymore. They were tired of all the fighting, so superheroes largely dropped off where westerns, humor, horror, and more stuff kind of took over the comic book genre. There was also a scare in the 1950s where people believed that comic books were just toxic for children's morals, so this led to the creation of the Comics Code Authority. You can kind of consider them like the MPAA for comic books, censoring anything that they find not suitable for children. Also, the Comics Code Authority is an episode entirely on its own. But with that, the Golden Age faded out. But in 1956, showcase number four hit stands. DC wanted to bring back superheroes like never before, reinventing some of their Golden Age heroes, starting with The Flash. This is what I see as the start of the Silver Age, although I know that it could be debated other things like the first issue of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, which as one article I read described as the Silver Age in a nutshell, which yeah, it is. Other Golden Age heroes were dusted off and brought into the new age of science, like Green Lantern now getting his powers from aliens and advanced technology instead of magic like before. These new variations of Golden Age heroes also created DC's multiverse. Science is really the key factor of the Silver Age, but how each publisher used science really helped define their characters. So DC tapped into the potential of science. Science can do anything and that's good. This is the time of the space race 
space and science is creating all sorts of new possibilities. But over at Marvel, science wasn't always a good thing. It was represented almost in a negative light. Science had limitless potential and that's scary. For the first time, we get this flood of reluctant and accidental heroes. Bruce Banner is tormented by the monster he becomes thanks to gamma rays. The X-Men are hated and cast out as freaks because of a mutation in their genes. The Fantastic Four constantly argue with each other. Peter Parker used his powers at first just to make money. He didn't even want to fight crime. These were real people with real issues. No pun intended. Spider-Man really broke ground on the Teenage Masked Hero, where in the Golden Age, Captain Marvel showed us that, yeah, kids can be heroes so long as they turn into big buff adults, but Spider-Man showed us that anyone can be a hero just as you are give or take a radioactive spider. The Silver Age is really where you're gonna find your goofy stories because the Comics Code Authority made mature stories basically an impossibility. So you had stuff like when Superman hit Lois Lane with a fat ray. More shameless plugs. Also, by now you can tell that I'm still getting over a cold. Now the end of the Silver Age, again, is very widely debated. So when I asked you guys last week what it was that transitioned the Silver Age into the Bronze Age, I hadn't done as much research as I have now. So we're gonna bypass this week's trivia challenge and I'm just gonna tell you guys what I've learned. Comic book historian Craig Shutt says in his book, Baby Boomer Comics, that there are many reasons why people think that the Silver Age ended, but a lot of them aren't really right. For example, the Gwen Stacy, the death of Gwen Stacy, as I always consider the end of the Silver Age, he says, happened way too late in 1973, and the Silver Age had already ended to him by then. In fact, comic books had already been changing into more mature themes and stories by 1971. He also says that the rise in comic book prices from 12 cents to 15 cents in 1969 is also not the reason the Silver Age ended, as some people might argue. He says, because comic books went from 10 cents to 12 cents in 1962, and nobody made a fuss about that, so why should it end the Silver Age? Shut says, and I would agree that the Silver Age ended as a combination of Mort Weisinger leaving Superman and Jack Kirby leaving Marvel to go work for DC within a month of each other in 1971. He said that there's nothing in comic books that could create more sadness and a greater sense of loss than Jack Kirby leaving Marvel to do something else. If only there was something in recent history that we could relate this to. A great man spending years of his life working on a project for Marvel only to leave and cast a great sadness throughout the land. The Bronze Age was the first attempt to do away with the silliness of the Silver Age. They brought darker, morally ambiguous characters and stories to the genre. They were striving for cultural relevance, bringing characters and stories and problems that culture was dealing with. Things like alcoholism and racism and drug abuse. Heroes started questioning their motivations, much like Americans started questioning their government. Captain America even changed his alias to Nomad after losing faith in the country's administration. Superheroines were becoming more independent, often changing their names like Invisible Girl to Invisible Woman. And the X-Men became increasingly more popular as people were striving for equal rights. Minority superheroes started making more appearances, although they were typically stereotyped. And with the Comics Code Authority loosened, horror titles became more popular like Swamp Thing or Ghost Rider. Stories would even begin to have more continuity. In the Golden and Silver Ages, a story would typically wrap up very nice and neat at the end of an issue or the end of an arc. There might be a couple callbacks or two later, but nothing really big, the hero would just kind of move on with their life. In the Bronze Age, however, things would happen that would rattle the hero for many, many, many more issues to come. Things like the death of Gwen Stacy rattled Spider-Man probably even still to this day. The art style focused on being much more realistic, and the first graphic novels hit the stands as well as comic book adaptations of popular media such as movies also made appearances. It was also around this time when westerns and romance comic books kind of fell off and was much more focused about the superhero. DC had the promise of publishing 50 brand new titles, but man did that plan backfire. It almost ruined the company for good. It's said that the Bronze Age ended when DC finished their Crisis on Infinite Earth story arc in 1986, which helped revitalize the company from its previous failure. Of course, this is just one opinion. Some say the Bronze Age never even ended at all and we're still in it. Others say that there's no one definitive point when it stopped, but it's just every single title and publisher had their own different stopping points, years separate from each other, that then pushed them into the modern age. This is a little bit sloppy for me, but 
It does seem to be the appropriate answer in my opinion. But if you thought determining the start and end dates of those past ages were hard, let's talk about the Iron Age, or the Dark Age, or the Modern Age. To some people, these are one and the same. To others, they're all completely separate, different eras. Even still, some say that the Modern and the Dark Age are the same, and the Iron Age is its own thing, or the Iron and the Dark and the Modern, it's, it's all confusing, and I just, I'm gonna try my best to make it as clear as possible for you. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm gonna take the idea of the Iron Age as its own complete separate era and throw that out the window. This age is defined as retcons and reboots to help fix some continuity errors that comics had after all of these decades. But if that's what it's defined by, then I still feel like we're in that era. So I don't want it to have its own separate piece of time. I see it almost like a pipeline that runs under the modern era and anytime we wanna flush anything down like bad continuity errors, and we send it right down there. That's what the Iron Age is to me. I'm also gonna squeeze the Modern Age and the Dark Age together a little bit, just to make it a little bit more clear. Uh, it's said that the Modern Age really started off at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths during the British invasion of comic books, when DC really gave a lot of their uh, lesser known characters over to writers who are largely from the UK. These titles included the likes of Grant Morrison's Animal Man run, Neil Gaiman's Sandman run, and Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run. But Alan Moore really ushered in the modern age of comics with his comic book from 1986, Watchmen. This grim tale, along with Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns book published that same year, showed us that comic books are definitely not for children anymore. These are dark, complicated books filled with psychological complexity. Antiheroes became more popular and darker stories became more commonplace. The death of Superman, Bane breaking Batman's back, Green Lantern becoming corrupt, and overly complex stories like Spider-Man's Clone Saga. These were all trying to imitate the success of Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns, and trying to give fans what they thought they wanted. Comic book crossovers became much more frequent and even kind of irritating to the comic book fan who would have to go out and buy a comic book title that they don't normally read or even like just to follow a story from a different book that they do like. This is still something that I have a hard time with. Independent publishing companies like Dark Horse opened up free from the Comics Code Authority, able to do whatever they wanted. And this is an entire episode all by itself, but comic collecting almost killed the entire industry in 1996. Comic book movies in this age really took off, as we all know, bringing comic books much more into the public eye than had ever been before. I know I really dove into comic books because of the first X-Men and Spider-Man movies, and I wouldn't be surprised if you guys also dove into comic books because of a comic book movie, or at least had your interest peaked. And of course, it's argued that the Dark Age ended and the Modern Age is its own separate thing, but the way that I see it is the Dark Age hit really hard and fast out of the gate from the Bronze Age, but then kind of slowed to a comfortable pace into the Modern Age that we're in right now. So I wanna know what you guys think. Which age do you think is better? The Golden Age with its focus on patriotism and good triumphing over evil? The Silver Age with its focus on science and goofy stories? The Bronze Age with its attempts at cultural relevance? Or the Modern Age with its dark and complex stories? Let me know in the comments. And I've been doing so much research over the past week that I would not be surprised at all if I missed something. So if I did, please yell at me in the comments below. But now let's move on to the weekly trivia challenge. So we spent a lot of time here getting nice and factual, but let's unwind with a fun Silver Age tale. Father's Day is coming up for those of us in America rather soon-ish, but I wanted to tackle a fun time traveling story that is 100% next level bonkers. In an issue of Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, Lois travels back in time to save Krypton from exploding, but gets sidetracked when she falls for a handsome Kryptonian man. This week's trivia challenge is, who did Lois Lane fall in love with while traveling back in time to save Krypton from being destroyed? If you know the answer or just want to take your best shot at it, you can do so in the comments. Be Below. And if you're right, I could feature you on the show next week. So get started on this weekly trivia challenge. So in the last episode of X-Men being a ripoff of Doom Patrol, Skull Kid 2999 said that really all characters are ripoffs of each other, but it's the situations that you put them through that give them their individual character. And this reminds me of something that Joe Simon, the creator of Captain America said. If it's a good idea and it's funny or thrilling or whatever it is, it's okay to do it at least 
eight times. And Lego Films 9894 asked if I could do an entire episode about the original draft for Fantastic Four, because I had mentioned it was a darker, different tale than we're used to. And I think, yeah, absolutely. I feel like I mention Fantastic Four quite often, but I've never actually done an entire episode on them. While Superman has gotten at least three episodes to himself, plus he snuck in here and there in other episodes, yeah, Fantastic Four, long overdue. As always, guys, I put the sources and links to everything in the description below. If you want to check where I got my facts from, you can do so down there. And if you want to listen to our podcast, we did one about a review of X-Men Days of Future Past. You can listen to it on iTunes, Stitcher, or right here on YouTube. And if this is your first time hanging out with us, I'd love for you guys to subscribe. Hit that big sexy subscribe button down below for more nerdy, comic booky type content here at NerdSync Productions. And as always, I'm Scott, and I'll see you next time for more things that you thought you knew about comics. See ya. This is gonna be like the dumbest thing I've ever said on this show, but if you don't know who the X-Men are, then allow me to give you the Twitter rendition, 140 characters or less. The X-Men are a group of mutants, or people born with superpowers, who are often rejected by the general public as dangerous freaks. And I'm generalizing a lot here. I think it's just important to get a grasp of who the X-Men are before we start making comparisons. Now it's been said that X-Men is a straight ripoff of another comic that predates it, and I asked you guys last week if you knew what that comic book was.